Does flexing your foot protect your knee in pigeon pose? Well, the argument goes that somehow the muscles on the foot that connect up to the upper shin will somehow tense and stabilize the knee joint so it's not all sloshing around when you're in pigeon pose. I'm Dr. Anthony Davis. Let's myth bust some yoga dogma. I wish this was a downward facing dog video because then I could say, let's myth bust some downward facing dogma. All right, let's talk about the foot. So first of all, if you dorsiflex, the ankle, what's happening is mm, basically the anterior compartment of the leg, um, mainly the tibialis anterior muscle, is going to be creating this dorsiflexion action. But guess what? That muscle does not cross the knee joint. It ends before the knee joint. So if the muscle ends before the knee joint, how can it stabilize the knee? It doesn't affect the knee. Well, yeah, but like everything's connected because, you know, fascia and tensegrity and stuff, right? I mean, kind of technically, but let's look for heavy hitting anatomical facts that really would matter before we start reaching for tensegrity as an explanation for stabilizing the knee joint. Well, okay, but when we dorsiflex the ankle, another thing is happening, and that is that we are stretching the back of the leg, the calves. So maybe the calves are stable the knee because they're being stretched in that dorsiflex position of the ankle. Well, here we're looking at this guy from the back, and if we have the calves on the back side of the shin and we stretch the calves out, yeah, we stretch them out this way, but guess what? If we have the knee bent, the calves do cross the knee, so they could stabilize the knee joint, so to speak. But if we bend the knee, which we do in pigeon, then we're taking that slack all the way away. So yeah, we might have some tension here at the ankle, but we don't really have a lot of significant tension at the knee joint. So I don't think that the calves can really stabilize the knee joint either because even though they do cross the knee joint, they're not in a position of tension really in pigeon. Now I will say there's one good reason to think that muscles could stabilize the knee in rotation. And that is if we can push through, if we're in dorsiflexion and we push into the edge of the foot, the forefoot, and we can even try to lift the heel here while we're in a pigeon pose. Well, what's really creating that rotation? I mean, what creates rotation at the tibia? Well, it's your hamstrings and your hamstrings definitely cross the knee. Oh, and wait a sec, hamstring strength relative to quad strength is a huge predictor for ACL ligament tears because what the hamstrings do is they prevent the tibia from moving anteriorly. So if here we have the knee joint and your hamstrings are gonna connect boom and boom, right? Well, basically, this tibia wants to slide forward. It wants to slide forward. And that is, um, well, the ACL stops that from happening. But if the hamstrings are not um, strong enough to pull backwards on the tibia, then that's where we get um, ACL tears. We get forward translation of the knee joint. The knee joint slides forward. The tibia slides forward. So maybe there's an argument to be made about activating the hamstrings by trying to isometrically resist rotation into the ground by activating the hamstrings. Maybe that would provide some kind of stability in the knee joint. And if nothing else, even if it didn't actually protect the knee, then it's just a hell of a good exercise to train the strength of your hamstrings in a bent knee position. By the way, when I was filming, my girlfriend tried to interrupt me to tell me, hey, what if we did this? And I was like, no, 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 that doesn't make any sense. And then after I stopped filming, I had to go back and add this little segment to be like, actually the hamstrings do kind of cross the knee, so that might be relevant. However, I want to add one thing though. This is going to be way, way, way more relevant in sport performance. So as far as protecting the knee joint in yoga, um, I'm not really convinced as to how much that would play a role because to actually injure your uh, ACL ligament, I mean, you have to get tackled in the knee joint. So that's where your hamstring strength really matters. I think we're kind of splitting hairs or grasping at straws if we're talking about hamstring strength relative to ACL injuries in a yoga setting because it's Rel relatively gentle compared to getting tackled in the knee.
But let's talk about other aspects of the knee joint and why a certain direction of rotation, maybe it has nothing to do with the muscles stabilizing the knee joint. Maybe it's an orthopedic concern of, of putting stress on your medial versus lateral meniscus or stressing your ACL and PCL ligaments in a certain way. By the way, I saw a video recently from a popular yoga anatomy teacher who, by the way, has no formal training in anatomy. And and they said that because the muscles don't cross the knee joint, basically don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. Well, guess what? That's a lazy, uninformed explanation. Let's talk about orthopedics. Okay, so in clinic, when I'm doing an orthopedic evaluation on somebody's knee, we do this test uh, called Apley's compression test. So we put the knee in a bent position while the person is face down. And then I load up the knee. I compress it down. And while I'm compressing it, I turn the foot back and forth. So I'm rotating the tibia on top of the femur. And the reason I'm doing this is I'm trying to create stress and irritate the meniscus. I'm testing for meniscus tears. And if I point the heel in and I feel, or the patient feels pain, sharp pain probably, or clicking in the inside of the knee, then they may have a medial meniscus tear. And if I point the heel out and I do the same thing, they may have a lateral meniscus tear. So maybe the direction of rotation of the foot matters for irritating or not irritating a meniscus tear if somebody happened to have one. If that's the case and medial meniscus tears are more common, then if we point the foot and the foot rolls like this, then the tibia is externally rotating. And that means that the heel goes in, which means the medial meniscus tear um, would possibly be irritated. So being in this position might irritate a medial meniscus. So dorsiflexing the foot internally rotates the tibia and might provide stability to the knee joint for somebody with a men medial meniscus tear. Additionally, we have rotation in the knee that can be related to ACL and PCL um, tears. So the ACL and PCL wrap around each other. And what happens is that the way that ACL injuries happen is that the foot turns out and the knee goes in and then you have an impact. Somebody like tackles you from the knee. And this is a loose position for the ACL ligament. Now, if we point the foot in and push the knee out, then the ACL and PCL wrap around each other and that provides stability in the knee joint. So this would be another uh, reason why if we dorsiflex the foot, we're rotating the tibia internally and this may provide more stability in the knee joint, especially for that ACL and PCL ligament. Now, I do wanna point out that I'm kind of being nitpicky. I'm pointing out orthopedic facts that may matter for some people, but for a lot of people, they aren't going to matter at all. But if that's the case, then how do you know what to do? If you're a yoga teacher, what should you do in yoga classes when you're teaching groups of people? Because sometimes we could make another argument that if we point the foot, then we are allowing, um, we're not forcing a rotation on the knee that might be uncomfortable because for some people that rotation might irritate the outside of their knee or, or any aspect of their knee because everybody's knee is a little bit different. And so forceful rotation on the knee by keeping the foot dorsiflexed may be painful for some people. So pointing the foot and allowing a bit of rotation here, allowing the tibia to freely rotate instead of being locked into place, maybe that's better for some people's knees. So part of what you can do as a yoga teacher is to allow people to experiment. And yes, that is okay. And allow them and trust that they have the intuition and sensory information from their knee joints to tell them if something is not okay. So we can bring people into a pigeon pose and we can say, okay, let's feel what we're feeling in the knee joint and let's try two things. Let's try dorsiflexing the ankle and see how that feels and push through the tibia and feel how it feels in the knee. Does it hurt? If so, let's try the opposite. Let's point the toes and allow the top of the foot to roll over and see how that feels. And maybe that feels better. Take the variation that feels better. By the way, I saw another variation called flointing, where you um, plantar flex the foot and uh, extend the toes. So you're flexing, pointing kind of, and that's supposed to activate all the muscles on all sides of the calves to stabilize the knee joint. But again, as we talked about, and here's, how, here's what it would look like. It would look like this, where you push and then lift the toes. So we push here, I'm active in the calves, 
and the, I'm really squeezing my calves, but I'm lifting the toes, so I'm, I'm lifting through the extensor uh, digitorum. But again, those muscles don't cross the knee, so I really don't think that's gonna matter too much for stability. It might just feel more stable because it's a more active platform, but not because it protects the knee, so to speak. So it's a, it's a fine option, but it doesn't increase safety of the knee. But let's talk about the elephant in the freaking room here, which is if you really are concerned about protecting the knee, let's not get <laughs> our heads so far deep into a biomechanical rabbit hole that we lose our minds and forget the really, really obvious fact. Why are we forcing people in pigeon pose to have a 90 degree bend in the knee and then externally rotate the hip joint again to 90 degrees, which is impossible for most people. So that, that rotation in the hip joint has to come from somewhere. It's probably gonna come from your knee. So maybe if we really wanted to protect the knee joint, stop doing forceful contortionism in yoga. Why are we doing this? What is the point? So this is where we can take these 90-90 um, variations where I can kind of lean into it at my own comfort instead of forcing the back leg behind me and really getting an insane stretch on the hip. I can just go until the point where I feel a little bit of tension and hang out there. It's a much more modest variation. Or if we really want this back leg behind us, why not just bend the knee a little bit more and we still get a good hip stretch, but there's no excessive uh, torque or rotation of the knee joint. I'm just saying, sometimes we get obsessed with anatomy because we want to sound important and it really doesn't matter. The bigger picture, we're totally losing the forest for the trees. If you want to learn more about functional movement anatomy, I have a functional movement anatomy course that I plug into yoga teacher trainings all the time. Check it out. It's part of my all access membership. I'm Dr. Anthony Davis. Movement is medicine. So move your body every single day.